Oh, hey everybody. I'm just here uh, practicing my juggling and trying to avoid bimolecular collisions in the air so that my juggling still works. So, you are here to learn about, that's right, reaction coordinate diagrams. So, what we're going to do is we're going to combine a couple of ideas. One that we've studied in depth in this unit, and another one that you've seen before, but now we're going to bring it back. And that is, we're going to take the idea of reaction mechanisms, what we've been learning over the last couple of videos, and we're going to tie it together with this idea of a reaction coordinate diagram, which you've seen before, you just maybe haven't learned all the details about it. So you see here I have an example of a reaction coordinate diagram here on the board. And so we're going to talk about a hypothetical reaction to start with, as we tend to do. We have A plus B going to form C. So <clears throat> what you do with a reaction coordinate diagram is you have energy on the y-axis and you have time or extent of reaction on the x-axis. Now up to this point, whenever you've looked at a diagram like this, you've just put a random amount of energy like E on the y-axis. But now, after learning thermodynamics, we know that this y-axis is actually G, free energy. So we're going to chart for a reaction the free energy versus time as the reaction progresses. So when my A plus B goes to form C reaction, I am just randomly assigning A and B this relative amount of free energy, and then C is going to have that amount of free energy. So eventually A and B turn into C. And it's hard to see, but it looks like my reaction is slightly uh, thermodynamically uphill. It looks like it's a wee bit non-spontaneous. So my delta G here has a small uphill value. Now, what we really are interested in when it comes to kinetics is talking about the red curve here. Right? How does A and B become C? We're going to get into the details of that as we already have with, me with reaction mechanisms. Now we're going to show how to represent reaction mechanisms in a chart like this, like a reaction coordinate diagram. Just a couple of other things before we start looking at our first example. So I've already talked about delta G, but one other quantity that I need to introduce is the height of the hill and going from reactants all the way to the tippity top of the hill. The height of that hill, as you can see here, is being labeled EA. That's called activation energy. So that's the, we refer to it back in thermodynamics as sort of the kick in the pants that reactions sometimes need to have in order for them to happen. So maybe we are trying to do the combustion of methane, and so the activation energy is provided by the spark of a flame to start that combustion. So we have an activation energy associated with our reactions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an actual mechanism we've already looked at before, and we're going to chart it out in a reaction coordinate diagram. So I'm going to get our first bit here out of the way, and we're going to take a look at this reaction mechanism that we've already seen before. Right, we talked about this in a previous video where we have NO2 reacting with CO to make NO and CO2, and we have our mechanism there. We talked about how a couple of NO2s have to come together to make the intermediate NO3, which subsequently reacts with CO to make NO2 and CO2. These two reactions add up together to give the overall reaction, and we talked about how it matches the observed rate law. Now, one little piece of information i got to remember to put back into my mechanism is the fact that it's the first step that is the rate-determining step. Okay, that's important to keep in mind. That's our RDS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these elementary steps, all right, these elementary steps into a picture like this reaction coordinate diagram. So let me drag over my fresh set of axes here, make them a little bigger so they become somewhat useful. All right, and that's about good. So let's go ahead and start to label this guy. So of course we have free energy on the y-axis and time or extent of reaction on the x-axis. So what I need to do is turn these elementary steps into a pretty picture. So I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here. Um, actually, I don't need to do the assumptions. I've done the calculations, and I know that this reaction, this overall reaction, is spontaneous. It has a negative free energy change. So I can represent that on my reaction coordinate diagram. So I'm just going to start here. Whoops, sorry. Change it to the pen. I'm going to start 
here for the free energy of my reactants, NO2 and CO. And since I know that this is spontaneous, I know that I'm going to end up somewhere lower. So let's say I end up over here for my products, and that's going to be NO and CO. I'm cramming it in here, I realize, but I'm just trying to fit it all onto the one page. So now I've got my thermodynamic information articulated. Now I need to start putting in the pathway. And this is where we have to pay attention to a couple of things. First, I know that the first step is rate determining. So the question is, how do I put that factor into my reaction coordinate diagram? I also know that I have two steps. Now, each step is going to be their own little hill in the reaction coordinate diagram. So the question becomes, when I put in two hills for my two elementary steps, do I have to care about the relative heights of those two different hills? Well, the answer is yes. And think about it for a minute. If the first step is rate determining, is that going to be the bigger hill or the, tall, or, or the smaller hill? It's going to be the bigger hill, right? The rate determining step dictates how fast the reaction can happen. So just like a real hill, a taller thermodynamic hill, or a taller kinetic hill, I should say, is going to take longer to get over than a smaller one. So when I draw my pathway here, I'm going to start off with a big hill and then have a second smaller hill that leads to uh, products. So I've got the shape of the reaction down in terms of the reaction coordinate diagram. Okay. And I guess if I wanted to be color-coded, I would have drawn the first hill um, here in blue to match my first step. And then the second step here would have been in red to match the color of my second step. So now I'm going to fill in a little bit of information. Okay, I've got the general contours of the reaction. This first step is where the activation energy comes from. Okay, that's my, my E sub A. And the difference from where I started to where I ended up, the net change, that's my delta G. And you can see that it's negative, so that tells me the reaction's spontaneous. Now, what I also need to put in is I need to put in what's present after each step. So here, I do my first step, and I have a valley. This is where my intermediates or unused reactants or um, initially made products are going to reside. So after we do the first step, what is in my system? Well, you can take a look at the reaction. After the first step, we make NO3 and NO, and we have yet to use carbon monoxide. So in this valley, I'm going to put all of these species that are present there. At that time, I have the NO3, I have NO, and I have the CO that I haven't used yet. So I'm really starting to put a lot of information on this reaction coordinate diagram. The last thing I need to put in is what's going on at the tippity tops of these hills. The tops of these hills are called transition states, okay? TS for transition states. Some people, um, uh, there, there are other terms for them, uh, activated complex, but I think transition state is probably the most commonly used term, and that's the one that we're going to use. So the question is, what's going on at the transition state? Uh, during the first step, two NO2s are colliding with one another, right, in a bimolecular event to transition into uh, the products of that first elementary step. So the transition state for this first step really just looks like up, get to the pen again, really just looks like a couple of NO2s beginning to collide with one another. The dot, dot, dot is the beginning of the two NO2s coming together. They're beginning to transition to products. And we often put transition states in brackets, so I'll offset them like that. Now, the details of exactly how the two NO2s come together, we're not going to worry about. We just know that at that moment, two molecules are beginning to come together. Likewise, the transition state during the second step has an NO3 beginning to come together with a CO. So that's the transition state for the second step. So now take a look at what we've done here. We've got a lot of information on this reaction coordinate diagram. And everything that's represented in the 
mechanism and the two elementary steps is depicted in my reaction coordinate diagram, plus a whole lot more information, like the fact that it's, um, that it's spontaneous. Uh, and like the fact that I've got these transition states. So there's a lot more information there in a reaction coordinate diagram than just in the elementary steps. So take a good look at this, okay? Right? You might want to pause the video, make sure you understand everything, because what we're going to do next is we're going to have you practice a problem. So let's see if I can shrink most of this down. Yes, I can. So I'm going to shrink that picture down. And now what I want you to be able to do before you come into class or next time is I want you to be able to turn this reaction and its mechanism into its own picture of a reaction coordinate diagram. Now you'll remember we've seen this mechanism before. We talked about this in a previous, in a previous video. And one of the key ideas to remember is that in this mechanism, it was the second step that was rate determining. So all the aspects of this, me of this uh, mechanism should appear in your picture of a reaction coordinate diagram. There's another factor you need to keep in mind. So we've got one, the second step is rate determining. The other issue you have to be able to represent in your reaction coordinate diagram is the fact that the first step is an equilibrium. What should that look like when you draw your reaction coordinate diagram for this set of elementary steps? We'll talk about it in class.